I bring greetings from Denver, Colorado, and the Buzans who are studying with us at the Bear Valley Bible Institute. Brian and Katie are doing great. They send their love and wanted me to make sure to say hello to everybody uh, and let you all know that they're doing well and they're enjoying their time. Uh, they are a sweet couple and we're proud to have them with us as we train them for ministry. We're excited that they're with us and all of them, uh, all of our new students. I'd ask for your prayers for the work at Bear Valley uh, as we continue to try to train men for ministry and as we uh, seek new ones to be trained. And that brings me to a question. Do you feel called to ministry? When we first ask that question, it may cause a number of folks to bristle up a little bit. No, I don't, I don't feel called to ministry. I mean, called to a lot of things, but I'm not called to ministry. And it's interesting to me that uh, we, we have to define that, that question a little bit sometimes for folks, don't we? We have to define the terms of the call. Well, I'm not called to full-time paid ministry. And I get that there's a difference there. I do get that not everyone feels compelled to give up their life and, and to go into full-time ministry as a preacher or teacher and uh, be paid to be a minister on staff somewhere. But do you feel called to ministry? You know, it's interesting. Scripture talks a lot about us being called. And I, I often, with what I do, talk to young men about this idea of coming to school to train for ministry, and I'm very interested at the answers I get. I spoke to a young man very recently who said, no, I don't feel called to ministry. I feel called to engineering. Okay, who's giving you that call? Is that a call that comes from God, or is that a call that comes from somewhere else? And he said, oh, no, it, it definitely comes from God. God has given me these talents and abilities, and I think I can use them for engineering. And I said, well, that's great. God gave you these talents and abilities. What are you going to do to serve him with them? And he paused. And he wondered. And his answer was, I'm not sure, but I know I'm going to use them for me. Isn't that kind of how we approach things sometimes? God's given us these things, and yet we figure out ways to use them for ourselves, but have we thought about using them for God? And in the letter of 1 Peter, he talks a lot about the calling that we've received. Uh, at least five different passages that we're going to look at where he talks about us being called. We're going to start with the last one, and the last one is in chapter 5, verse 10. I love that sound, by the way, the sound of Bible pages turning when you preach is an encouragement to your preacher. I'll tell you that right now. Turn those pages. Look at those texts, right? He says, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Notice that we have been called to his eternal glory in Christ, to God's eternal splendor. That's really what glory means in its essence, is his, his brilliance, his splendor. And we've been called, we like that call, don't we? That's one we will respond to. We want heaven. We want to go to heaven. We want to have eternity with him. That's a call that we have heard and we will answer and we just can't wait to get there. But the question becomes, do we understand the other calls that go along with that one? You know, do we only respond to the calls that sound good to us, that sound comforting to us, that sound positive to us? Or are we willing to, to respond to the calls that maybe make us more uncomfortable, maybe make us more challenged in how we live our life and what we do? Because uh, if we start in chapter 1, we go back to the beginning of the book, he's going to remind us of the first call that he lists in the book. And notice in verse 14, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, 
be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. Notice he begins with this idea of, of obedient children. Peter particularly is going to make this contrast between those that are obedient children and those that are not. He, he has told us how we became children earlier in chapter 1 in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who by his great mercy has caused us to be reborn, to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance. Who gets the inheritance? Children get the inheritance, don't they? We are born again into God's family. When we allow God in his great mercy to save us, we're born into his family. Scripture often talks about us as newborn babies, but we are born into this family relationship with him. We become part. He says, I want you as adopted children. I want you as part of my family. And then Peter in verse 14 says, So as obedient children, listen to your father and don't be conformed, don't be molded. And that's really what that word conformed means. It's like pressing wax or clay into a mold. Don't be shaped by your former lusts that were yours in your ignorance, but instead be holy in your behavior, just like the Holy One who called you. Now, in his second letter to the early church, he's going to describe the people that reject the master who bought them and who have denied the right way. They have wandered off from the right way. They were part of the family, but they're not anymore. And he calls them accursed children. So notice the contrast. In his first letter, he's talking to those as obedient children. In his second letter, he, he identifies those that are accursed children. Which one are you? Isn't that the question we need to ask ourselves? Are we going to be obedient children? Or are we going to listen to our father? Are, are we going to allow him to guide us and shape us and mold us? Or are we going to be molded to our old way of thinking? And he says, don't be molded to your old way of thinking, but rather like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in some of your behavior. I mean, be holy yourself in, in, in most of your behavior. Be holy yourselves in as much of your behavior as you can. You know, just when you have time. Is that what he says? He says in all of your behavior. Is that difficult? Is that a more difficult call to respond to than the call to his eternal glory in heaven? I think it is, isn't it? Because this call means we've got to change. This call means we can't do things the way we've always done them. This call means that there's got to be some transformation in our relationship with God. We can't live the way we used to live. Our Father now wants us to live like He wants us to live. And as obedient children, we respond to Him and we accept His leadership. We accept His holy behavior. And so we strive to be holy in all of our behavior. Three little letters. Boy, that... That three little letters is a, is a big word, isn't it? All. So what does it mean to be holy? Well, I think we understand the word. You know, in, in a modern context, it's almost become a slander. It's almost become a slur. Oh, you think you're so holy. But the word literally means to be set apart. God himself is set apart, isn't he? He's set apart from the world. He's set apart from evil. He's set apart from sin. And what does he want us to be? He wants us to be set apart as well. He wants our behavior to demonstrate that we're no longer joined with the world. We're no longer walking with our own logic and, and thoughts. We're, we're walking in a way that honors the Father who saved us. We try to conform ourselves to his holiness. And that means that our behavior should stand out in the world. And it's a question that I think each one of us has to ask and answer. Do people around you know that you're a Christian? Can they tell by your behavior that you're different? I, boy, I tell you what, I think this is our greatest struggle, isn't it? I mean, we're freaked out by the same things they're freaked out by, the economy and the politics and everything. What? Just read social media. We seem to be just as stressed out as everyone else about everything that's going on in the world around us, we don't seem to have any more peace than they do, but shouldn't we? 
Our behavior seems to be just the same as everyone else's. Oh, wait a minute. You're right, Michael. I don't cuss and I don't drink. They'll figure it out from that. Will they? What about kindness? What about love? What about those things of showing mercy and forgiveness that the Father has shown to us? What about those things that manifest Christian behavior in our life that we demonstrate to others? Will that stand out in this world? I mean, if we're just simply kind to other human beings, isn't that going to stand out in the world? Have you driven on our highways these days? Is kindness a common feature? No. Hold a door. <laughs> Say thank you. Help someone in need. Provide something for somebody that can't get it for themselves. Those characteristics are not common in our world. And they will differentiate us if we do them. But we think as long as I put on this suit and this tie and leave my house early on Sunday mornings, my neighbor's going to say, I wonder where he's going. He must be going to church. I bet he's a Christian. And we pat ourselves on the back and say, see, they know. But my coworkers don't when I blow up in anger at them over little things or the people that I go to school with don't when I participate in the same sins that they participate in, when I watch the same movies they watch, when I am entertained by the same sinful behaviors that they're entertained by, and I laugh about them, and I joke about them, I don't look any different than the rest of the world, do I? And God has called us to be different, and we don't like being different because it makes us stand out, but who does it make us stand out to? A world that doesn't know our Father. And don't we want them to? Don't we want to introduce them to our God? How are we going to do that if they don't see us as any different than the rest of the world? As they, if they don't see the benefits of Christianity like the, the rest of the world doesn't have the peace, the comfort, the calmness in the face of chaos in the world around us, the strength to get through the difficulties that we have in our lives, our holy behavior can shape us in so many powerful ways and it can be a, a testimony to the people around us that we're different and our Father is different. And so when they ask us, tell me why you're different, it gives us the opportunity to tell them about the God we serve, doesn't it? And so we've been called to be holy. Well, the second verse that he uses in the, the book is found in chapter 2, verse 9. Notice he says, but you... Notice the beginning of verse 9 is a contrast. Contrasted to what? He's contrasting those that are disobedient. It goes all the way back to chapter 2, verse 7. Notice in verse 7, he says, This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, the very cornerstone, this became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Notice very carefully, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were appointed, but you aren't that way. As obedient children, we believe. We don't disbelieve. We demonstrate our faith and trust in God by being obedient to his commands. We let our Father lead us, and we strive to be obedient to him. And because of that, but you are a holy, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for God's own possession, quoting from Exodus 19. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies who have, of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You've been called out of darkness. Have you accepted that call? You see, the things of our former life, those former lusts lead us to darkness, don't they? Our life before we came into a saving relationship with God and His Son, Jesus Christ, was a life walking in darkness. We wandered around trying to figure it out for ourselves. And we were pretty proud of that, most likely. We probably think we had it pretty wired. We had it pretty covered. You know, I'm, I'm figuring this out on my own. I'm, I'm pulling myself up from my own bootstraps. But you think about the messes that we create in our life because we walk around in the dark. Have you ever been someplace that's really, really dark? 
we went to North Dakota and we found some caves near Mount Rushmore, that area. Uh, and, and we went inside these caves and we went deep underground. And at one point, the tour guide said, watch this and turned off the light. And it doesn't matter how long you're down there, your eyes don't ever adapt. You know how when you walk into a dark room, if you stay in the dark room for a little while, the room gets brighter. Down there, there's no light. And it doesn't matter how long they, you stay down there, your eyes will dilate as much as they can. There's no light. Guess what? You still do this and you can't see your hand. It's dark. That's the description he gives of the life that we used to live. You know, Scripture says in, in, in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Ever go camping and forget your flashlight as you needed to walk away from your camp a little bit? You thought to yourself, what? I know where camp is. It's right here. I'm just going to walk over to here. I'm, it's not very far. And you walk, and after a while, you start to realize you can't see the ruts that are in the road. You stub your toe on a rock or a root. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, what direction is camp? And if I had just brought my flashlight, right? Well, God has given us a flashlight, hasn't he? He's called us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. He'll guide you. He'll provide a light to your path if you let him. But you have to look at his word in order for it to be the lamp. You have to read his word for it to be the light. You have to accept what he's telling you in order to come out of the darkness that your life was before you met him and enjoy the marvelousness of his life. And how often do we want the marvelous light, but we love the darkness? It's exactly what John was talking about in John chapter 1 when he said, evil loves the dark. And sometimes we do too. We, we will keep the self-rule in our life so much so that we would rather walk in darkness than allow him to lead our path and light our path. But we've been called to something better. And I would argue that you're not going to receive the blessing of the calling of chapter 5, verse 10, unless you accept the calling of chapter 2, verse 9, aren't you? And so we must respond to the call to come out of darkness. That means change. That means transformation. It means doing something that we aren't always comfortable doing. The third verse in 1 Peter that reminds us of, of a call is found in verse 21, but the context for that call is really in verse 20 of chapter 2. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently do it, this finds favor with God, for you have been called for this purpose. For what purpose? To do what's right, even if it brings suffering into your life. And there's a call that challenges us, doesn't it? You see, we know that what he's called us to do is to do what's right, but is it always easy to do what's right? There are times when doing what's right is going to bring suffering into our lives. There's times when doing what's right is going to cause problems at work. There's times when doing what's right is going to cause problems with our friends. There's times when doing what's right is going to cause problems in our family. And rather than do what's right and suffer for it, what do we do? We continue to walk in that darkness, don't we? We keep our mouth shut. It's just easier to navigate without all the extra stuff. You know, that atheist that we work with, we don't want to say anything to him. That's going to make work life a mess. That person that's pro-LGBTQ that we go to school with, we don't want to say anything. That's going to upset our peer group. But we're called to do what's right, to make the tough choices. And we're fooling ourselves if we think the right choice is always the easiest choice. The right choice for Jesus was to go to the cross. Was that the easiest choice? As a matter of fact, in the garden, what did he ask three times? That he might not have to do it. But he ended each time, he ended that prayer with, but not my will, but yours be done. And do we have that same resolve 
to be obedient children and to do what's right, even if it brings suffering. You see, once again, we're not going to receive the call of chapter 5, verse 10, if we don't receive the call of chapter 4, or chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. The next verse that we see is actually in chapter 3. And I think this is another one that is particularly challenging. He says in verse 8, To sum up, all of you be harmonious and sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. Why? For you've been called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That inherit word connects us back to chapter 3. He has caused us in His great mercy to become part of an inheritance. We're part of His family now. We've been called to receive a blessing, and He wants us to be a blessing. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. And don't we often do that? People do something to us, and what's our first thought? Well, I'm going to get even. Do we, are we ever satisfied with getting even? <laughs> Somebody does something to us. Are we really ever really satisfied with getting even? No, they do this. What do we do? We're going we're gonna to up the ante just a little bit, right? We're going to get them a li- back a little bit more than they got. We're going to show them not to mess with me, boy. I'm going to tell you what. They mess with the wrong person, and I'm going to show them, and I'm going to up the ante just a little bit, and then guess what they do? Are they looking to get even? No, they're going to up me a little bit, and then I'm going to up them a little bit, and it, and it cascades out of control, doesn't it? Were we evil to God before he, in his great mercy, caused us to be born again? Did he reserve, return evil for evil? Wasn't our life an insult to him in the way he made us and our choosing the world over him and choosing Satan over him? Wasn't that an insult to us and to him? And didn't, did he return that insult with an insult? No, he provided a blessing in his son, didn't he? Even while we were yet sinners, he sent his son. He didn't wait for us to be reconciled back to him. He didn't wait for us to come back. He didn't wait for us to fix the mess in our life. He said, even while we were in rebellious sin against him, he sent his son to save us. Why? Because he loves us and he wants that relationship with us. And he wanted to provide a blessing. And guess what he wants from us? He wants us to be a blessing to others. And that means that when someone does something evil to you, what does God want you to do? Be a blessing. How hard is that one, people? That's a challenge, isn't it? I don't like you when you do evil to me. I don't like you when you insult me. But it takes a different heart to be a blessing, doesn't it? You can't keep walking in those former lusts. Those former lusts say evil for evil, insult for insult, eye for an eye, tooth for a t- I'm going to take care of myself. And God says, no, you've inherited a blessing. Be a blessing. Even when it's hard, be a blessing. Even when you don't want to, be a blessing. Why? Because you have received the greatest blessing I can give you. And as my children, I want you to reflect me to the world, not you. Brothers and sisters, it is not our job to reflect ourselves to the world. It's our job to reflect our Father to the world. And that means that we are different. So, Michael, you've mentioned all of these calls. I haven't once heard you mention a verse that says that I'm called to ministry. I want you to look at chapter 4. And in chapter 4, in verse 10, Peter says, As each one has received a gift, Each one who? Each one of you that is called to be holy. Each one of you that has been called out of darkness and into my marvelous light. Each one of you that has been called to do what's right, even if it brings suffering in your life. Each one of you that has been called to be a blessing, even when people insult you and do evil against you. Each one of you that have been called to inherit my blessing 
as each one of you has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You want to know what the word serving is? It's the word ministry. It's the word that we get deacon from. It's the word that we get minister from. It's a word that means to serve others. And God has given each one of you a gift. And as his children, what does he want? He wants you to use that gift to serve and minister to others. No, I get it. You do not have to quit your job and come to preaching school and become a preacher. But never forget that as God's children, you have been called to ministry. Every day, our job is to minister to others, to minister to his church, to minister to the world, to reflect his love in our life so much that people see God in us. We have to respond to that call. Yes, I know we want chapter 5, verse 10. We want that eternal glory in Christ. But we aren't going to get it if we reject these other calls. We may fool ourselves into thinking we're going to get it if we reject these other calls, but the reality is we must be holy. We must be willing to come out of darkness and walk in His light. We must be willing to do what's right, even if it brings suffering into our life. We must be willing to give others a blessing because we have received such a great blessing. But most of all, we've got to recognize that God gave you a gift. What is it? I think that's part of our challenge, isn't it? So many of us will say, oh, he didn't give me one. Each of you, notice the language here, as each one has received that doesn't leave anybody out that's in this room. Each one of you has a gift. Now, I'm going to argue that they're not all the same gift. You don't have to get up here and preach, gentlemen. Maybe that's not your gift. That's okay. But what is your gift? And are you using it to minister to others? Find out what it is. Maybe it's just kindness. Maybe it's encouragement. Maybe it's providing food for people. Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's being a cheerleader and patting people on the back and keeping them going when it's a struggle. Maybe it's visiting people in the hospital. Maybe it's song leading. Maybe it's serving as a deacon. Maybe it's teaching a Bible class ladies to the kids or to, to the other women. Whatever it is, part of our job is to determine what gift has God given me and am I using it for him, not just for me? And so often, what is your career? You want to find your gift. Most of the time it's found in what we're doing in the world, honestly. I mean, if he's given you a gift that you're using to have a career and, and skills that are valuable in the world, are they valuable in his church? Most likely they are. But are you using him, them for him, not just for yourself? Are you using them to serve God and others, not just you and your family? You see, that young man was right. Maybe he has some talents and abilities to be an engineer. But does God need church buildings built in third world countries? Do they need an engineer to help them do it? Could he do that? Right? God's called me to be a doctor. Great. Are you teaching people about eternity, not just fixing their bodies? God's called me to be a lawyer. Have you provided legal services to people who need it, who are downtrodden, and teaching them the gospel? We can find a way to serve God in the things that we do in the world. We just got to ask ourselves, do we recognize that we've been given something that's greater than a, a worldly talent that can create money to pay our mortgages and our cars and our cell phone bills? We've been challenged. We've been called to use those skills to minister to others, to share the love of Jesus Christ and our Father, with people that are lost and dying. And brothers and sisters, we got to stand out in the world for them to see that. Our behavior's got to be different. We've got to look to answer the calls that God has given us. Well, maybe you have felt called, but you've struggled with how to respond. I hope this morning I've given you some 
mechanism, some, some confidence from the text that God wants you to respond to his call, but the first one he wants you to respond to is to come out of darkness, to turn your life over to him, to allow him, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, to allow him in his great mercy to cause you to be reborn. Paul in Romans 6 is going to say that's done through the waters of baptism. We take that old man of sin and we bury him. We put him to death and we bury him in the waters of baptism and we're raised to walk in new life. A new life as a child of God. A new life that's part of an inheritance and part of a family that we weren't a part of before. Have you responded to that call? Are you still caught in your sins? We're here to study with you. We're here to hug your neck. We're here to pray with you. We're here to share that call with you because God wants you to answer that call. Maybe you've answered the call to be a part of his family, but you've struggled with how you fit into this family, this family here at Sun Valley, where you can serve, what you can do, how you can be a part. I know the elders are here to help. I know the ministers are here to help. Respond to that call. Find a way to serve the body here with the talents and the gifts God has given you. Become an active part of the family. And God will bless you. Whatever your need this morning, if you need prayers for health issues or concerns or spiritual struggles, if you need to simply answer the call to his eternal glory in Christ, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.